All right. So um, hopefully you're in the right place. This is meditation for grief during the holidays. And as I mentioned before, and as you know, you know, this is, this is a really hard time. And, and the woman on the, on the left to me symbolizes that those triggers that we run into when we're least expecting, we're walking down the street, we see something and, and we feel overcome by grief. Um, and then the lady on, on the right who just, she looks so lonely. And I think these are very common feelings. And I, I've spoken to a lot of people already this season about grief. And there's so many things that come up. I mean, even to, if you have children and you feel like you really need to put up a tree to give them a, a normal Christmas experience, but yet you feel like going to the attic to get that down might make you feel like you just are nauseous. Um, you know, some of the things you can do in, a, in outside of meditation are calling in your your troops. So if there are people who said, you know, what can I do? What can I do for you? This is a good time to call them up and see if they'll put up the tree for you. See if they'll host the holidays. Um, lean on others. So that's a non-meditation thing you can do. But the bridge to meditation is really about giving yourself permission to take care of yourself, whatever that looks like during the holiday season. And my goal for tonight is to really teach you how to calm anxiety and stress during the holidays, how to fortify your immune system, manage your reaction to difficult people, which might be somebody in your grief circle. It could be a sibling or another relative or another friend. Sometimes that difficult person might be yourself too. So ways to manage that and how to develop an attitude of self-kindness, which is the ultimate act of self-care. So for those of you that have access to the chat, how many of you type in there if you're practicing meditation already? Do you have a, a regular practice or have you dabbled? Or maybe this is your first meditation event. Just go ahead and share that with me so that I know who's out there. The thing is, is even if you are a regular practitioner, as you might know, um, coming back to the basics is really what it's all about. It's not that we become advanced meditators. We just become more skillful at, at putting our mind in a, in a place that's going to be helpful for us. So I've got lots of regular practices. I've got some people who facilitate meditation, a couple people who've done a course, some some people who've new to it. So hopefully all of you will get something out of this evening. So some of the uh, specifics of the triggers that that have shown up for me when I've been grieving, um, I think is when I'm grieving during the holidays, it's it's wondering how am I going to find the energy just to, to get through, um, to walk down the street, to go to the grocery store, uh, to put up with the, the cheerful people. And one of the things that we can do is acknowledge to ourselves that this holiday is going to be different. And one of, uh, one of the things that we can also do is acknowledge that by taking time out to actually mindfully grieve during the holidays is doing grief work, which is going to support us throughout the year. And so sometimes people will come up and, and say to you, you know, time heals wounds or, or you've, you've read that somewhere. I mean, that's one of those things get bantered around. And those of us who have experienced a major loss know that it's not about time. And the research actually shows that it's what we do with the time that matters. And Robert Niemeyer, who's a grief researcher and psychotherapist, he was actually able to boil it down to where he could see that in bereaved parents, time actually only accounted for 1% of assimilation. That's it. You know, so if you, if you hear somebody say that through the holidays or you just have got to get through the holidays, know that it's what you do during the holidays that's going to make a really big difference. So the first technique that... I'd like to teach you tonight is the relaxation response. If you've done the relaxation response, feel free to type it in chat if you're familiar with it. 
many of you've probably already elicited the relaxation response, maybe without even knowing it. And what this is, is a practice that is rooted in the Hindu tradition of uh, transcendental meditation, which some of you might be familiar with. But it was studied by a cardiologist, and he was able to pull out the essence of it and basically make it a secular practice, but you can certainly apply your own spirituality to it. This is my go-to practice for the early days and months of grief. Uh, grief is such a physical experience early on. And I'm wondering from those of you who want to share, what are the, how have you felt in your body when you're grieving? How's it shown up physically? So you can type that in the chat if you want. Um, some of the things that, that I've experienced and my clients share with me are things like headaches, nausea, muscle tension, just feeling like your heart's going to cave in. Um, someone, Brenda just said, it feels like someone is kicking my chest in. Yes, that's what grief feels like. And while we all might have our own physical experience of it, there's some real common things that show up um, because grief, in addition to being a heart response, um, it's, it's also a stress response. There's the stress that goes with, with grief itself you know, or with, with the loss itself. And then there's the secondary stressors, which can show up at the holidays, um, financial stressors, having somebody to help you ferry uh, the kids around or take care of elderly parents or just help you with, um, you know, the grocery shopping, the, the things a partner does. Um, you know, in addition to the fact that your heart is crumbling, um, Beth, Beth just said it's disorienting and debilitating. And I think that really nails it because whatever your experience is, it's, it's like something's been removed from your life. And the relaxation response is a grounding practice. So if you're feeling like you're kind of floating around and you're disembodied and you're on an, another planet this practice can bring you back to earth without you having to figure anything out. Grief is not something we can fix. It's not a fixable thing. But what we can do is find some ways that we can remove some of the suffering. And the first thing we can always do is take care of our physical body. Now, especially during this season, most of us become busier uh, than we'd like to be. Most of us become busier than we are the rest of the year. And there's little downtime. We, I mean, as a culture, we just don't take a lot of time out for ourselves. Now, a lot of you on, on this webinar have said that you're you're doing your practice daily, or you at least have dabbled in it. And what I'm proposing is that we recommit to our practice for the holiday season. Like right here, right now, we start again um, and make sure we practice daily. And some of you are going to already have a practice, and it's likely that your practice already elicits the relaxation response. Anything where you focus your mind and attention for a period of time and you repeat that focus and attention, no, no matter how often you get distracted, that's going to take you out of the fight, flight, freeze response and put you into the natural state that is the relaxation response, which by the way is the physiologic opposite of fight, flight, freeze. So I see Gail, uh, Gail just put, she doesn't sleep well and her head hurts. This is the practice for that. This is the practice for body aches and, and body behaviors that you don't want. So back to the practice itself, as I mentioned, a, a cardiologist boiled it down to its essence. And I, I'm often fascinated by the list of things that, that doing this for just 10 to 20 minutes a day can can do in our body. And here's the list of some of the things a relaxation response 
meditation can do for you. Um, it can reduce anxiety-related symptoms in your heart, such as palpitations and shortness of breath. It can reduce headaches, gastrointestinal problems, skin problems, pain, sleep disorders, autoimmune disorders, mild to mod moderate depression, multiple sclerosis, uh, fatigue, asthma and allergy related uh, symptoms and anything that's complicated by stress. All right. So hopefully I've sold you on the importance of this practice. So now let's talk about what does it take. So the relaxation response is one of the most simple meditations there is. To begin, you take a few moments to just relax your body as much as you can. When you're grieving, that might not be a lot, but even if you can soften your body just one to two percent, just a little bit, a little bit of letting go, that'll help. And after you've softened your body a little bit, all you do is breathe naturally. And on each exhale, you repeat a word over and over and over again. And every time you get distracted from the word, you just come back. That's it. And studies have shown that if you can practice this for 20 minutes a day, that you actually reduce your genetic predisposition to stress. But I've created a guided meditation that you'll be able to download that's just five minutes because I know that this time of year it can be hard to get in a longer set, but you could just start with the five minutes or do that five minute meditation several times a day or even practice until the bell sounds on the guided meditation and just keep going. There's no, no, nothing that says you have to actually stop when the bell sounds. And, and this is a practice that I'm hoping you'll commit to this holiday season, just as daily practice. So you want to try this? Just type in the chat box if you're ready to actually try some meditation. And let's get started. So we'll do a very short one. And like I said, you can do this longer on your own. And the research shows you can pick any word to focus on. This is a mantra meditation, by the way. So you're going to use a word as your object of focus. And you can pick your own word, but for the holiday season, I'm offering you a word, and that word is simply peace. It's not resolution. It's not enlightenment. Let's just find some peace. So wherever you are, assuming you're not driving, if you're comfortable, let your eyes close. So you don't need to be looking at the screen for this. You can just close your eyes or you can find a point upon which to softly gaze. If you, if you have trauma or PTSD or have intrusive images, maybe just gaze at the flowers on the screen. And turn your attention to your natural breath as it comes and goes. It doesn't matter what it's like if it's deep or shallow, just accepting your breath as it is for the moment. And rather than thinking about your breath, see if you can feel the breath, experience the breath. It's rhythm, it's pace, the motion, the temperature. Noticing your breath just as it is and recognizing that this experience of breath is happening right here, right now. And now let the next breath be a little longer and start to fill up your belly as though it were a balloon with air taking in as much breath as you can without causing strain or struggle. This will also lengthen the exhales too. 
just three or four of these. Let all let go of all effort on the breath. Let it go back to natural, easy rhythm. And imagine that you could soften just a little bit the places where you might sense that you're holding onto any tension. Your jaw, your tongue. Your shoulders drop away from your ears. Your hands unwind and soften to whatever extent you can the arches of your feet, your toes. And any other places where you might be sensing muscle tension, imagine you could just let it all unwind. Again, even just a little bit, doesn't have to be all the way. Now turn your attention, all of your attention to your next exhale and the next and the next. And silently to yourself as you exhale and each time you exhale, simply repeat the word Peace, silently to yourself, peace. Let your breath repeat naturally and then pair up that word and the breath out. If you get distracted, which you might be by my voice, just start again. The key is starting over without criticizing yourself. Coming back is just as important as the focusing. Now let go of the word and just take a few moments to feel the impact of that very short but often effective meditation. What's changed in the past few minutes, if anything? And if you wish, you can share that with me in the chat box if you are able to still type which this practice always fascinates me because in such a short period of time, it interrupts our fight, flight, freeze, and it helps us find refuge. This practice is particularly good if you have had a trauma, whereas practices such as mindfulness meditation 
while wonderful. And it's the root of, of everything I do in the early days of grief, hanging out in wide open space of awareness might contribute to a sense of overwhelm. So I'm seeing that the, the reports coming in or a sense of calm, slowing down, feeling more space. I can breathe again, relaxed, more relaxed. You know, so the way this will help us through the holidays is by fortifying our immune system, giving us a refuge from distress and creating that much needed space. There's a saying in, in the grief world that me time is good, isolation is bad. So this is the kind of me time that's going to help you process your grief without actually thinking about it. Because again, sometimes turning towards our grief is a little painful. This gives us a refuge. I see more people relaxed. So the, the piece I want you to leave with, with the relaxation response or what I really want to underscore is grief can make us feel like we're out of control of our body, our mental state, our emotions. We become very, many of us experience forgetfulness. Um, you just feel really rattled. And so there is that sense of a loss of control. And there are things we cannot control, but there are things that we can control. And our health and our emotional state, we have a lot more dominion over those than we think. So I hope you'll practice this one every day to just build up some resilience. So I see more peaceful. And again, you can swap out a different word. As long as your word's neutral or positive, if it's on that scale, um, it works. But uh, a negative word obviously wouldn't work. And I recommend not using the name of your special person just because that sometimes will be a trigger. Uh, but there is a meditation that I'm going to give you. We're, we're not going to practice it tonight, but you'll have access to it in the uh, the, the coping with grief during the holidays mini course. That's an imprint meditation where you actually can turn your attention to, uh, the, the special person that, that you're grieving. And, and thank you, Brenda. She said so simple and so effective. A lot of times we think meditation is complicated or fancy or, um, esoteric, but it's just so basic. So moving on to the next, the next practice, and those of you who've, who have worked with me, I know there's a few people on here from the grief group um, and from real life, real life grief group too, uh, an online grief group, meta meditation, which is the practice of compassion and loving kindness is a way to kind of mindfully deal with human beings <laughs> Because a lot of our stress during the holidays can come from either being hard on ourselves. Um, perfectionism is a big one that I see, particularly for parents who are grieving that have small children um, who might feel like we need to replicate the holiday, you know, exactly as it was before. But we know we can't. That's rather futile and um, it can cause a, cause a, cause a lot of pain uh, when we do that to ourselves. But again, that's a cultural norm, I think, is, is we try to do everything right. And so instead of being about getting things right or being perfect, compassion is more about recognizing that you're precious, you're special, you're worthy of love and that when you turn towards yourself with kindness, you actually can become the best you you can be without being perfect. It's like if your intentions, if, you're, if your deep intention to be kind and compassionate is there, then the actions are going to follow. And as far as dealing with other people, 
I don't know how many of you on this webinar have someone in your family that's grieving in a much different way than you are. And it can be a little edgy to be around them. Um, you know, maybe you want to talk about the person and they don't, or um, one of you is managing the estate. You know, these are things that can make it really, really hard. And we know we can't change other people much as we like. Um, I know as a grief, you know, when I'm working with a grieving client and um, I guess I'm always on my client's side. So I, I can, I can admit that, uh, that filter that I have. And I hear that, that someone in the family is being hostile or difficult. I always want to, I, I wish I could write on a piece of paper, you know, be nice to this person and be like, hand this to them. Uh, but that's, I can't <laughs> because it wouldn't work anyway, would it? So the only thing we can do is, is change ourselves and, and change our, our attitude. Um, I experienced this in my own family firsthand. Um, many of you know that 40 years ago this month, actually 40 years ago last month would be the, it was the anniversary of my uncle's death by suicide. And in remembering that first Thanksgiving with my grandmother and how she really tried to just power through it and cook the big meal and be in a good mood when we, we knew she was suffering and that carried through the rest of her life. And it used to make me really upset, especially when I was a teenager that she couldn't acknowledge um, that Doug died by suicide. But as I got older and a little, a little more uh, aware, and, and once I really started practicing compassion, um, I was able to see that her, her grieving style was rooted in her own pain and she was doing exactly what she needed to cope. It didn't necessarily make it easy on the rest of us. Um, but once we could accept that this was what she was doing to feel safe, it made it a lot easier. You know, it doesn't tie it up in a neat bow or make it perfect. And I'm certainly not advocating for letting people walk all over you. You know, that's that's not okay. We still need good boundaries. But taking some time out to recognize that everybody in your grieving circle and everybody who's grieving in the world is suffering. And that suffering can really impact our behavior. And that includes you. That includes me. So how many of you, again, putting this in the chat, how many of you are familiar with the practice of the formal practice of loving kindness and compassion meditation? I know a few of you have, have learned this with me, but I'm wondering if anyone else has. This is a practice that, interestingly enough, um, in your brain, when you cultivate compassion, your fear, your fear center in your brain switches off. So I, I think fear is definitely an experience of grief that many of us have because our assumptive world is shattered. The, the rug has been pulled out from under us. Um, and that's really scary, not to mention uh, back to the secondary losses, the fear of how am I going to pay the bills, how, you know, the little things that, that can add up. Um, so this, if you're feeling fear or anxiety, this is a really great practice. Or again, if you're dealing with someone who's challenging. So I see some of you are familiar, familiar, but struggle. Yes, <laughs> that means you're probably really practicing it because it's not, it's not an easy practice. And I, I, I was wondering, you know, is this, is this the right thing for a webinar? But I think sometimes the, the practices that bring a little bit of struggle are also where we can get a little bit of growth and to be compassionate to yourself and know you don't have to do any of these perfectly. In fact, you can do, you can be really messy and sloppy in these practices and they're still going to have an impact. And that's true with yoga too. We always say in yoga, be messy, um, just play. And, and that's true with, with meditation as well, even though in some respects we're trying to have this pristine focus, we're also trying to be human too. Um, 
Yes. Uh, oh, <laughs> yes, I am definitely saying it's okay to be sloppy and messy. You know, that's kind of the first domain of compassion is for ourselves. And um, if, if we were expected to go into meditation and do it perfectly, I don't know that any of us would really embark on it. Um, and I've been practicing for over 15 years now, and some days it's easy and some days it's not. Uh, and compassion is a practice. It's not something you are ordained with. It's not a mandate. It's something you just try your best at. So we're going to do a short version of this because when I lead this in full, it can be, uh, you know, 15, 25, 45 minutes. And you have a 20 minute practice that you'll, you'll have access to. So we're going to do a diff a slightly different form uh, of this practice. It's worth saying that, that classically the way this is done is you visualize a person or a spiritual being or even a pet um, that brings up feelings of well-being and love and you send them a series of words and you also try to send them a feeling in your body. So you, this is, this has three components to it. It has the words, it has the image of the person or being, and it, and it has the feeling. And during the practice, you might lose track of one. That's okay. Um, having the other two will kind of bring that one back up. Um, and you go through a series where first you send it to yourself, then you send it to this beloved being, then a friend or family member, and then a neutral person, and then a difficult person. And then you get to send it to all beings. But we're going to do a shortened version. But I do want to say before we dive into this, that working with the difficult person, and this goes back to the Buddhist teachings, it should not be your worst enemy. Again, back to, to not having to be perfect. It was not expected by the Buddha that we could just visualize someone who's caused us immense harm and be okay. That would probably hurt us further. Um, when you're ready, you'll know it. But to start, pick, um, and we're not going to do a difficult person tonight, but I just wanted to give you this. Pick somebody that you can imagine reconciling with. Somebody that you think you can make up with in the next month or two. All right, so that's all for you to tuck away in your head, um, but let's get to heart. So bring your attention down to your heart center, and if you wish, you could close your eyes. Again, or you could find a point upon which to softly gaze. And bring to mind a person or a being. And again, this not the person who has died, but someone either living or uh, a spiritual figure. So they don't have to necessarily be real, but somebody who cultivates that feeling. Or it could be a spiritual leader, you know, Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, somebody that you think um, if you met them, they would just love you because you're, you're human. And as you bring that person or that animal or that teacher or mentor into your mind, see if you can feel in your body what it feels like when they are offering you care and support and love. So what does it feel like to be in their presence? And bring into your mind's eye an image of them, maybe imagining that you could see their eyes, you could meet their eyes, that they're smiling. And offer out these words. May you be happy as I wish to be happy. May you know peace as I wish to know peace. May you be free from suffering as I wish to be free from suffering. Now imagine 
that you could see yourself through their eyes. How they see you as this being worthy of love and care. See if you can feel that as though you're receiving their kindness. And then offer these words to yourself. May I be happy. May I know peace. May I be free from suffering. May I be happy. May I know peace. May I be free from suffering. And now imagine that you could offer that out to all the people in the world who just like you are feeling grief during the holiday season. All the people that are faced with the same struggles and questions that you have. And you can include yourself in that circle too. And just for the next few moments, I'm not going to lead the words. I'll let you lead yourself silently in your own mind. What words of kindness do you want to offer this group? And I'll give you a template you can work from. So may we be free from this suffering. May we be kind to ourselves. So just what is it you want to say to yourself and others? Let's reflect on that. Feel it. Imagine you could see all the people. Use the words. And now you can open your eyes. Hmm. So what was that like? Feel free to share in the chat. That was a very short uh, and modified meta practice. Uh, but I think that it really supports the idea of, of self-compassion as not only a personal experience, but in recognizing that all people suffer. So, you know, we, we work there by recognizing that, that somebody who, with this big heart you know, that we want them to be happy and, and free from suffering. And I know happy is a, a strange word when we're grieving. And you can replace that with something else. But, you know, we all want to be free from suffering. And, and then sending it to ourselves, which might be a little edgy, but then recognizing that we're not the only ones. Okay, so when do we address our loved one and when do we go to the hard person? So, Ed, I'm really glad you asked that. So, we're going to, you have access or you will have access shortly to the full long meditation. Um, and I'll be sending that link out shortly. There's a 20 minute meditation, meta meditation that will include your difficult person. And then there's another meditation that is specifically for you and your loved one. And that's called the imprint meditation. And I'm glad you brought that up because I definitely want to talk about it, even though we're not we're not doing it on this call just because of the time it takes. But in the imprint meditation, you spend time turning towards your person because one of the the strange phenomena that that might be happening to you, I know it definitely has happened to me, is where nobody mentions them. You know, it's like this elephant in the room. Not every family is like that. Some families, you know, the pictures come out, the memories come out, the stories come out. But, you know, for some of us, uh, you know, like with my grandmother for, you know, decades, we did, you know, around her, you just didn't talk about Doug. Now, my mother and I did. We found our own way. 
Um, but the imprint meditation lets you reflect on what ways are you like the person? What ways are you different from the person, both physically, emotionally, your hobbies, really being with the essence of your loved one. And I think it's one of the most powerful meditations or one of the most powerful grief experiences. That imprint meditation does not come out of the meditation tradition. It actually comes out of the grief therapy tradition. Um, and in grief therapy, we know it's important to acknowledge the person. And during the holidays, I think, um, as I mentioned, you'll see it in the, the online mini course. It's a wonderful ritual to do during the holiday season. This year and years to come is to sit down and connect with them. And then you can even write a letter afterwards. You know, write a letter to your loved one telling them, you know, how are you like them? What are you grateful for carrying forward? And you can even take it a step further and maybe think of a tradition um, or a ritual to do with the whole family around what you uncover. So turning towards the person and turning towards your own feelings is really, really important. So thank you, Ed, for bringing that up. And I see Mar said, I really liked looking at myself through the other kind person's eyes. I hadn't done that before. That is really nice. And um, I don't know about you, but sometimes that can feel a little shocking. Um, I know the first time I did that, I kind of felt this resistance, like I couldn't see my own uh, my own goodness. But once I got comfortable with that, I got really comfortable with it. Um, so I want to make sure we have time for question and answer, but I just wanted to briefly touch on Kristen Neff's three core components of self-compassion, because again, one of the key things I want you to take away from this webinar is that you have permission. I'd write you a little script if, if you, if I could, um, you have permission to be compassionate to yourself. And uh, in the wonderful book by Kristen Neff called Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself, she breaks out self-compassion into three areas. The first one is self-kindness. The second is common humanity. And the third is mindfulness. And I see, Lisa, you just shared, it was hard to see my own worthiness through another's eyes. I get that. And um, if, and, and Rebecca asked, any tips for helping people get comfortable to receiving kindness from others? So this uh, self-compassion, the core components, starts with self-compassion. And again, you can be messy here. You do not need to be for, perfect. I think the first thing is to practice being kind to yourself. And one way to do that is to jump down to mindfulness and be mindful of how you speak to yourself. Be mindful of your own headspace. And when you notice that you're being hard on yourself, you can jump to common humanity and recognize you're probably not the only perfect, only person who isn't perfect. Um, let's say I know an experience I had when I was um, grieving as I missed an appointment. And I, you know, cause I was forgetful and scattered and, and I felt horrible and, um, I was being really hard on myself as though I were the only grieving person who'd ever forgotten an appointment. And so kind of looking at yourself and saying, wow, are other people like this? And would I judge them as hard as, you know, as hard as, as I judge myself? And I wouldn't. Um, and even if I would, that's, that's data, that's something to work with. So self-kindness is something that you can start practicing now. If you go back to that first meditation we did, the relaxation response, and do that every single day, that in and of itself is going to start creating the resilience that you're going to need to be kind to yourself. Um, sometimes self-kindness is just about carving out some time to be with yourself then you'll get more comfortable with yourself. Um, I don't know how many of you, and I bet it's a lot, uh, find that staying busy can help you escape the feelings of grief, but that's also an avoidance, and that's that's not always kind to yourself. So even just spending um, time feeling what you feel, and I'll give you I'll give you another little bonus. We'll do a little bonus exercise. So just just take one of your hands right now and 
gently, you know, maybe go back to that really kind person you visualized in Meta and, and bring your hand to your cheek and maybe just gently stroke your own cheek. Or if that feels uncomfortable, you could put your hand on your heart or you could stroke the back of your hand with the other hand. And just notice your breath as though you're soothing yourself. So what's happening in your body right now without you doing anything other than just gently stroking yourself is your body starting to release the hug hormone, what's called oxytocin. It's what you get when you hug other people and when you pet a dog or a cat if it lets you. Um, and that right there is self-kindness because that hug hormone, oxytocin, is a barrier against stress. And when you're less stressed out, it's going to be a lot easier to be kind to yourself. So, you know, that's one way you can really, it's so simple, again, simple, um, just to be nice to yourself. So, you know, going back to that question, how, you know, tips for people to get comfortable on receiving kindness from others. Start with yourself. Once you can see yourself as worthy, it gets a lot easier receiving it from others. Make it a practice, okay? Catch yourself when you're being critical. That could be, that should probably be the next webinar we do. This is the first webinar like this, and, and I'm really excited to do it, and I plan on offering some more. So maybe um, self-compassion, self-kindness will be the next one. Um, so just in closing from, from this, before we go into the into the question and answer, I just, I wanted to give you this quote from author Gary Rowe, who wrote a great book called Surviving the Holidays Without You. I got it on audiobook. I actually like having him read it to me. Um, but don't let the holidays use you. Use the holidays to grieve well and love others. And so whether you're using the holidays to build up some physical and emotional resilience or whether you're using the holidays to uh, connect with the difficult people or, or um, learn how to just be okay with yourself, whatever it is that you need for the holidays, I really do hope that you will practice, practice, practice. And ultimately know that I'm wishing for you that you may know peace and be, from, be free from suffering this season and always. So I'm going to come back to the screen. And again, I wish I could see you all. I see a list of names. Um, but what questions are there? You can just type them into the chat. I, this is a big topic. It, it could be I think we did one at the meditation center. We did this in an hour and a half. I think it could almost be um, a day long <laughs> retreat. Um, so the name of the book was uh, Self-Compassion by, uh, oh, there's two books I mentioned. One is Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff. Um, and the other is Gary Rose, uh, Gary Rose Surviving the Holidays Without You. And yes, and both are on Amazon, and I believe both are available as either audiobooks or books. And I mention that because one of the interesting things about grief is that it can get hard to read um, just because concentration can be a challenge. And so I think audiobooks can be a nice uh, a nice solution to that to that issue. Um, so again, you're going to have access to this mini course. And right now, um, and I'm going to pop up the I think this should pop up the offer. You'll also in two hours or so, or like two and a half hours, you'll get a link to this, to a replay of this webinar um, along with this link, but I'll go ahead and, um, so I think it should pop up and a, a tab might say offers or something, and you can click on, on that. Oh, I need to click, click a button. There we go. Um, again, it's free. And, and the reason I'm doing this is because I do want to build this out into a much longer course because it is a huge, huge topic. And so you all are like, you're the beta testers. You don't even have to do anything, but you'll have access to whatever, um, whatever I put in there at, at no charge. So this is something that um, I really hope to just keep building and building with some tips, both meditation and otherwise, because as I've moved into this holiday season and 
uh, reflecting on what happened 40 years ago in my family. And, and so we've had many losses since then. That was just probably the most pronounced. Um, I, I really wanted to, to dive deep. And for me to dive deep, it's so much better if I can share it with others. Um, so again, back to questions. Let's see. Oh, okay. Somebody lost sound, but you came back. I'm, I'm glad I came back. Um, and Tabitha said, I'm seven years out, but it feels like last year at times. Yes, Tabitha, it does. I get that. Um, we had a woman in our, we did this workshop at the meditation center this week. And there was a lady there who was 10 years out and was saying it's different every year, but it's still grief. You know, it's still grief. And so I think that's another place where we can be compassionate to ourselves. You all know it, it doesn't end. There's no end point on this. We just build the tools to bring us as much peace and reduce our suffering as we can over time. You know, it, it's, you know, not, I don't mean over time, it's not time, but over time and grief work. So, um, oh yes. And, and Sarah, thank you for sharing that, Sarah. I'm really glad this helped. You know, when we have such an unthinkable loss in our lives, um, you know, again, this, this is what I do <laughs> is, is I, I hear stories and sometimes I notice in my own body, like that desire to just fix it, to make it better, to say the right thing. And there is no way to fix it. And there's no way to make it better. And there isn't the right thing. So what, do, what can we control? We can control our body. We can help our body become our ally by giving it these tools to combat the stress and anxiety. And that will give us the space we need to maintain the continuing bond with the person we love, you know, to turn towards the pain and not stuff it. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. So um, just a few more minutes here. C can anyone see that, that link? I hope that showed up. Maybe a couple people could pop that in the, in the box if you were able to see it. Um, if not, again, you'll get an email in a couple hours uh, once the video is processed where you can come back to this and you'll get the link so you can uh, pop in. I think I actually, I think I have a, let me share the screen real quick because um, this is what the course will will look like and you'll just click on, on the enroll in the course for free. For those of you who are already, um, who are already enrolled in the uh, mindfulness and grief mini course, or if you're in the meditation for grief course or the meditation for grief support group, you won't have to enroll in the school. You'll just go to this and um, probably fill out your, your name and email and it should be added to your, your course roster. Um, for those of you who have not in the meditation for grief in any of the courses, uh, you might have to fill out a couple things, but it should not be too hard. It won't ask you for any money. So, um, and I welcome your feedback by email. My email is heather at mindfulnessandgrief.com. And whether it's a story of how this has helped you through the holidays or a question on just the technology, I'm here for you. Um, so, I, I'm really grateful. Oh, good. A few of you said you were able to register. I'm really glad. And Ed, Ed mentioned you need to log in first. So even if you're already a student in the school, um, you might need to log in as yourself. So thank you all so much for, for joining me. Again, this is the first webinar I've hosted. And um, I had to work with my own anxiety around the technology and you all have been so loving and supporting and I appreciate you chatting to let me know you're out there because again, it, I, I connect with people, not webcams. Um, so anyway, thank you all so much and let's just close with a little a brief meditation. So just close your eyes. And bring your hand to your heart. Let's bring your hand to your heart. Establishing that connection with yourself. And just offer yourself words of kindness and support that might help you through the holiday season. And these might be words of acceptance 
much as I accept you just as you are. I love you as I love beloved friend. Or may I be free from this suffering. Just offer yourself any words of kindness you wish. And thank yourself for taking this time out to practice. I really hope that you will incorporate the guided meditations into your daily life. You just already did it. You've already started. You can tick off today. Tomorrow, just start again. Doesn't matter what time of day you do it. Just get that five-minute relaxation response and dive in. So thank you. May you all no peace, and be free from suffering. Thanks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you all. You're so kind. Hmm. All right. Have a lovely night. <laughs>